Good evening, everybody, and добрый uh, вечер. Время настало начать наш вебинар, вечернюю дискуссию. Um, меня зовут Ольга Сезнева. Я перейду на английский язык через две секунды, поскольку язык сегодняшней встречи — английский. So, I would like to welcome you all, and I would like to welcome the participants uh, to our first discussion in the series of lectures and uh, roundtables or discussions. And today we are talking about the issue of what is the urban normal. Um, I want to say a few words about the organizers of this series. Uh, we are supported by the French uh, Institute, Institute Francaise in St. Petersburg. We are also uh, supported by a program of urbanism and participation at the European University St. Petersburg. And we are intellectually supported and inspired by a transdisciplinary postgraduate program, Building the City Now. Um, there are the invisible hands uh, behind the screen. Anna Krasnova, she is our MC. She is letting you guys in and make you sit comfortably in your virtual chairs. Um, there is a chat open now uh, where you participants, our audience, can pose your questions. In a few seconds, I will introduce the speakers, but I just want to say a few words about um, our procedure. How are we going to do this tonight? We prepared three questions, three topics, which Five of us, six of us actually, experts at this round table are going to take up and uh, talk about. We will take about 45 to 50 minutes uh, to discuss these questions. And after that, we will open a uh, space for questions and answers. So I really ask that you please pose your questions in the chat. I will read them um, as we go, but I will pose them for the participants at the end of our discussion. So, now the exciting moment of introductions of our speakers. I would first, I would like to introduce um, Enrique Massibosch who is co-director of the program Building the City Now, a professor at UPC Barcelona Tech, and he's an architect. I would like to introduce Marguerite van den Berg, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Amsterdam with interest in urban policy, gender, and work. We also welcome Ines Aquilue, who is also from Barcelona, UPC Barcelona Tech. Uh, she's an architect with interest in urban conflict and urban complexity. It is my pleasure to be introducing Nastya Galavnova, a sociologist an activist from the University of Amsterdam interested in the political implications of urban design. And finally, I would like to welcome Daniyar Yusupov, urban planner specializing in urban revitalization, who also teaches at St. Petersburg University of Architecture and Civil Engineering. As you can see, we really mixed architects and non-architects, planners and sociologists in the spirit of the program, Building the City Now, which seeks to develop a pedagogy which decenters knowledge and expertise and brings the best out of professions in designing and thinking about the city. 
So, by the way of introduction, I would like to say a few words about the normal. Why and how we decided to focus on this issue. As we know, the world is now enmeshed in a significant health crisis, which stretched to all levels of society. Containing, controlling, and remedying COVID-19 requires a lot of consorted efforts, which goes beyond the uh, realm of one knowledge or one expertise. The daily briefings, quantitative graphs, projections, regulations, guidelines, data sets, and profiles of those on the front lines fighting the metaphorical enemy prompts us to think that this is not normal, the life as we lived it in the past three months. And it deplores us to consider what we might do after the coronavirus. And I would like to share with you um, a few slides here. Perhaps that is not going to happen. <laughs> My apologies for that. I wanted to show you a graph released by Interpol, which depicts in a very sort of a cartoon format what the new normal in the city should look like. Working from home, protecting your privacy, monitoring your children, monitoring your belonging, and uh, being publicly responsible for your private bodily presence. And this is titled The New Normal. Now, against the supposed from above political new normal, many people still harbor fantasies of the old normal in the way they knew it. In these fantasies, the normal takes a particular shape, right? It's all about hugs and a hand, uh, handshake, concerts and cultural gatherings, vacations and travel, romance and dating, and not least, the availability of culinary experiences, that is a restaurant time. And cities are very clearly the centers of this imagination. They also are associated with these very specific experiences that I outlined. But who knows the cities in the way that I just described them? whose experience that really is. So and although we're still trying to make it through the pandemic, we should also be concerned about how much we really want to get back to what we regard as normal. And to know that, I think it's useful to start with our first question for the speakers. What were the experiences on the ground during the lockdown in the cities that you know? And what do these experiences suggest about the sense of normal? And I would like to invite first Enrique to speak for a few moments, for a few minutes on this topic. And again, I invite our audience to pose questions, reactions in the chat. They can be written in Russian as well as in English, but not French. Unfortunately, I will not be able to translate it. Enrique, please. Thank you. Um, I think that what we all experienced was an extraordinarity that we haven't imagined before uh, it happened. Uh, in reality, um, the total, the global lockdown is something that defies any, any reasoning, right? Um, but it happened, and it happened in a sudden. Uh, cities were empty, people didn't move from home, relationships were virtualized even more, and we had to change our everyday routines 
um, all that happened in a matter of a few days. Uh, what I mean to say is that even though we had never imagined such a thing, it did happen. Not only it did happen, but it did happen gladly on our part. On the part of most people, it happened without a problem. It happened totally uh, unreluctantly. Uh, and the cities became a test bed uh, for a new situation that would have been impossible to propose otherwise. Um, what the, it actually matters to me the most in, in this uh, situation is that there, it was created a dichotomy between interior and exterior, right? The house was safe, the exterior was unsafe. And that, that dichotomy uh, will take a long time to wash away, I, I am afraid. Not only it will take a long time to wash, to wash away, uh, and to reconquer public space as a safe space, but it's also a false city in itself. The interior is as much control as the exterior. It is not safe at all. Our homes are not safe. Our homes are not normal. Our homes are the realm of companies and governments. And in this sense, we have to fight as much as we have to fight to get back into the streets, we have to fight for a safer interior in our lives. Marguerite, would, we, would you like uh, to pick up on this and uh, continue, please? Thank you for having me. This is a lovely yet a little bit strange <laughs> occasion. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'd like to talk about this unit of the house first for a little bit. So in this crisis, we were asked to shelter in flames, right? To find safety in the home and uh, in, in, the, in this quarantine. And so the unit in many imaginaries of the city in this crisis became uh, this household. And uh, in the Dutch, which was a relatively, which is a situation I'm most familiar with, which was a re relatively mild lockdown, right? So we were still able to go outside quite a bit. Uh, still here, there was a far-reaching uh, attempt to claim public space and also private space. Okay. Um, and so this household appeared as this shelter. And I'd like to zoom in a little bit and read to you um, uh, the, the definition that the Dutch government used to, uh, to, to tell us what a household consists of. So the Dutch are allowed to get closer than 1.5 meters uh, to those in public space or in private space that are part of the same household, which is taken to, me, to mean, and now I quote, spouses, registered partners, or other life companions and parents, grandparents and children, if they live at the same address. Student houses, communes, and care homes do not qualify as a household. So family, or those living in a family form, were considered households and could come closer than the 1.5 meters, and those living in other arrangements, but still, and I would say more relevant, given the way that viruses spread, using the same kitchens and bathrooms were not a household, right? So this had quite far-reaching implications, I would say. It's a you know, very deeply heteronormative, and I would say also bourgeois imaginary of the city. And I think also an imaginary of the city that's quite profound, profoundly anti-urban, right? So the city appears here as this collection of households, which are then families, and these families are then uh, also homeowners, right? So in this imaginary uh, urban space is not the space for meeting strangers, or for politics, or for diversity, you know, and, and, and meeting the other, let's say, but for remaining in this family household and, and including all its violences, right? Because I think a lot of people knew for the longest time that, that the home is not a safe space at all, right? Especially women and children. So there are two concrete effects 
uh, I think that are, that, are, that are important to note. Uh, so first is violence in lockdown, right? So the idea that the household is a shelter, I think is something that many and especially women and children uh, were unable to relate to, right? So this quarantine intensified situations of violence enormously, I think. And so in, for, the, for people that experience this at home, uh, suffer this at home, public space is usually an escape space. Um, and this was unavailable now. Um, so that's one concrete effect, I think. And the other uh, is that, um, uh, interestingly, so I just mentioned that student housing was not to be uh, considered a household under the Dutch emergency laws. Um, and so actually fines were given to students from our own university, the University of Amsterdam, for eating together in their own kitchens, right? So it was very, very clear, very real effect uh, of this family imaginary of what a household uh, means, an enormous curtailing of freedoms, I say. So this, and you know, I, I think it's important to see that this is not only just a, a loss of normality, but it's also an, you know, an intensification of forms of dominance that were already in place, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that consistency and coherency is important. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Ines, I would like to invite you now. Hi, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this um, conversation session. I would like to, to talk a bit about the relation between public space and private space during, during the lockdown. And I think that uh, we can find some opportunities and many difficulties. I will start uh, with some difficulties or the main difficulty that I, that I found during this, this lockdown was the need, uh, well, here in, in Barcelona, at least, it was a very hard lockdown. There we, ha we had, um, well, we only could move if we had a deep region or, or in order to go to work or this kind of uh, major activities or something like that. And then it has to be very hard to go outside from your private space to your public space. And uh, it has, uh, well, uh, in terms, well, we need like a kind of reason to go out outside. We could not go outside, you know, because we feel like we need, we had to have a reason. And this, this has to be a, a kind of controlling your, your behavior in terms of cause an effect. You need a cause, do an action outside of your home, of your home. And I think that this was one of the one of the worst, uh, the major difficulties in this lockdown, lockdown. And it was also related with the space because our our decision to go to the public space or to the space outside has to be uh, has to be, has to have a cause. It could not be something uh, well that you feel like to do it. No, this was a, a major problem that I felt during this uh, during this lockdown, and uh, raises some well um, points out some difficulties be between your freedom of choice and uh, the sense of uh, well public health that we have uh, among all of us. Uh, uh, an opportunity that I think that we had during this lockdown was that this, at, at least in Barcelona or at least in the neighbors I know here in Barcelona was the local complexity. Uh, in neighbors where you can find more or less all you need, you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't need to move far away to do your daily life. This makes you you're easy during the lockdown, uh, your life during the lockdown lockdown easier, although this ends of being um, being quarantine, being locked down, uh, you you had all all what you needed in 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 ten minutes, in fifteen minutes, and this local complexity make it easier uh, to uh, to run. Uh, the other the other point that I wanted to well or maybe was uh, was some kind of bizarre during this lockdown was this feeling of being outside and inside at the same time. For example, when you were 
uh, if you went to uh, the bakery and you wanted to buy something, uh, you, you should queue and you were queuing outside or going inside. And this makes you feel between an inside and outside. And in terms, you were like, um, like breaking the rules of being inside or outside or being in private and public. That was something that used to be controlled. No? Well, and these are some of the experiences I had during this lockdown in relation to space and So here is the problem of freedom of choice, but also reduction of the complexity of the city. Mm. Yeah, of course. That, that you articulate so nicely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Nastya, may I invite you, please? Yeah. <clears throat> Olga, thank you so much for such a great introduction on the hardship of uh, normality. Because what I wanted to focus in my contribution was what does it mean to feel normality uh, or the lack of it uh, from the everyday perspective. Because this feeling normality is something that resists quantification, something that states and corporate elites are trying to propose as the basic visualization methods of what happens to us. When I feel about feeling the norm, when I think about feeling the normality, mm -hmm. the lack of it, um, I think about the story described by one of my favorite scholars, and it's not directly related to pandemic, but as far as I will tell the story, I think it will become clear what lessons I personally got from it and what we can do with this story. So it was retold by Susan Lee Starr, who has an allergy to onions, uh, a very banal thing. And uh, she described the peculiar situation when she found herself in McDonald's many years ago, and she wanted to order a burger while ordering, remembered that she needed to add a very simple phrase, please don't add any onions. She received her order in 45 minutes while observing everyone else getting the order in a lightning speed. In the grand scheme of things, this story of her having troubles, hardships of having onions and receiving her order in 45 minutes is very uninteresting. No one will talk about it as a catastrophic happening, unlike we talk about pandemic. But, and Susan Lily Starr also understood it. She used this story in order to notice that particular type of system and infrastructures, such as McDonald's, they cannot deal with anything that is out of the ordinary. And she takes this example in order to say two things. First, it is quite too dangerous to assume that systems, such as welfare state or medical care, are infl infinitely flexible because they are made not to be flexible. And second, that there is always a misfit between what an individual can need or want and what the system, which is standardized, can provide. Why I talk about this story is that when I tried to conceptualize what is happening right now in the past month, the story kept coming to me as if what is happening is that we are kind of these people stuck in McDonald's and capable of ordering the food that was from it by fast system of fast delivery, system of delivery of some basic needs. And this is what unites us and Susan Lily Star, because we need to wait and because we realize that the system is not flexible. The lack of elasticity of the system is something that paralyzes some action, but also thinking, like as an academic, as a sociologist and an activist, it is hard for me to think about it and to be clear about it, what's going on. And I observed this lack of elasticity in particular to, in the case of the country I come from, Belarus. Um, I'm most familiar with this case, even though I'm a movable body that caught pandemic in New York, needed to travel to Amsterdam and have my family and friends in Belarus. There, restaurants, coffee shops, movie theater, everything remained open when European countries announced lockdown. Their churches were packed. People were playing uh, hockey, soccer, having war parades. And um, in this regime, people needed to go to work. In this regime, children needed to go to the school. This autocratic regime, which we see now in Belarus, actually responded with a very dismissive, we have no viruses. But people went to school and to work, not because they were not afraid, but because they had no other opportunity to do differently. My parents continued meeting their clients, friends, co-workers, 
But I also saw that despite of normalizing this life, I've heard a lot of fear in their voices. They were suspicious of people in the streets, the feeling that they never had before. And when we would have conversations about how they feel right now, they emphasized that they don't experience a particularly extraordinary crisis because they have been through so much more already. The virus is not special than all the crises they have been through. Um, and um, actually, they tried to make jokes about it and say that we will just take an extra alcohol, take a bath in the very warm water, and that's what will make us feel better and safe. When I asked if they stored enough food, they confirmed that they have been storing it already for many years, waiting for a crisis, but also they're doing it out of the simple habit since 90s, and I shouldn't worry for them. And I think these conversations, together with the story of the allergy to onions, made me think that the feeling of normality is actually a quite privileged feeling that particular people can have this nostalgia for. The dream about normality is very unequally distributed between different places and different situations. And it sounds like this is the discourse of the state and corporate elite addressed at middle classes. It is not addressed at marginalized groups who already never felt the life to be normal in a way. My dream would not to come back to the normal. My dream would be to use this space and this lack of normality in public discourse in order to change things for the better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nastya, and thank you for articulating so beautifully the sense that we all share and that motivated us to organize this conversation. Normality is a privilege, a form in which it comes needs to be analyzed, deconstructed, and understood in the context of privileges and disadvantages. Thank you. And Daniyar, could you please step in? Hello. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I would like to, um, to share my obs uh, observations about how it was uh, here in uh, Russia and St. Petersburg. Uh, some uh, points are interesting. I would like to split my observation in three parts and uh, beginning of restrictions and uh, prolongation of restrictions and the end of restrictions where uh, where we are now. Um, for, for the first part is uh, most interesting uh, questions were are we ready for that kind of restriction or not? Were we ready? Uh, in which point uh, the new normal is appearing. And I would say that uh, there is not some, something new for Russian people uh, to adjust for new and new restrictions. We already have uh, restrictions, uh, limitations to gathering, um, uh, uh, to gathering of mass uh, gathering political, uh, because of political reasons. We have, we have now uh, the period of voting on um, changes in the constitution was planned uh, for the uh, um, end of April and shifted for <laughs> for the day of tomorrow. Uh, now uh, we get in, restri uh, in restrictions in the middle of March, uh, and uh, this is a typical time annual time where uh, the most park and uh, gardens in the city and out of city uh, are closing for public visiting because of dry out period uh, after winter time. So this, it's normal for us, do not enter in parks in the beginning of, <clears throat> of spring. There's something you uh, it's restrictions for visiting museums, theaters, and uh, cinemas. Uh, at that point, we shifted to uh, internet services. Everybody learned how to visit uh, Victoria Albert Hall concert and um, how to see all the uh, beautiful Italian films of 15th. Um, uh, that's a, the hard point was the online format for us, uh, for scholars, for pupils. Uh, everybody is staying at home, uh, so we get uh, the outbreak of domestic violence for this. Uh, 
uh, point and also the uh, restriction to uh, funeral processes and visiting cemeteries and churches. Uh, for Christians, it was quite hard uh, point. The beautiful appearing of uh, this period, uh, especially for St. Petersburg, is uh, image of empty city. Uh, image of uh, which was uh, the uh, which is illust is illustrating the idea uh, on which uh, based was the city the kind of normality that we lost uh, last decades because the idea of the city is uh, inhabited sculpture no cars and no uh, peoples on the streets uh, just uh, beauty and the sky and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so at uh, the next period that, uh, from the middle of April uh, is appearing that, uh, yes, uh, restrictions will be prolonged. Uh, so the people try to, uh, mm, uh, try to think about how to bring the diversity in their lives. And they start to, mm, uh, they began uh, more appropriate the little that is available for them. For uh, some, uh, seventy percent of inhabitants of Saint Petersburg are living in a green micro rayon district. So, okay, a park are closed for visiting. We will walk around the, uh, our homes uh, and uh, try to. <clears throat> find something uh, uh, something new in a round. The uh, most of uh, people uh, remember that they have dachas, uh, there's uh, garden settlements which are spread around the city and in, in nearby region and who uh, uh, those people that not have uh, their own uh, uh, gardens, small garden that uh, they can uh, rent uh, dacha houses or guest houses. Uh, so you cannot find at the moment any proposals around the city. Uh, every, uh, everywhere is sold and rented already. Um, uh, and so <laughs> the new normality come to uh, Karelia is a, a region nearby. Uh, uh, nearby, uh, that uh, uh, the citizens of small Karelian cities uh, meet the sophisticated uh, demands of uh, uh, people come, uh, which come from St. Petersburg. And uh, St. Petersburg citizens uh, discovered the beauty of uh, nature and the uh, soul of small towns uh, or of nearby region. It's, uh, something interesting and most lovely pa point at this period for me especially uh, uh, four millions uh, foreign tourists uh, that uh, every every year come to St. Petersburg don't, don't came at uh, this year and uh, a lot of uh, beautiful apartments in central uh, part of the city its most beautiful part uh, uh, become available for a lower, lower price. Uh, and uh, those people that uh, don't have uh, their own gardens, don't have, uh, cannot uh, uh, rent the dacha, uh, they come to their, uh, to those apartments, beautiful apartments, uh, in order to somehow change their lifestyle to uh, the citizens of St. Petersburg becomes tourist in their own uh, city. It's a quite uh, <laughs> amazing point. That <clears throat> the next, I'm close to finish. Uh, the next uh, period is the uh, end of the restriction. And this is a point of which the new normality is forming and coming in. Uh, yes, parks and uh, parks are uh, from yesterday uh, are open to visiting. Theater, museums, and uh, restaurants will uh, will turn back to the people. Uh, we are sure about it. Uh, restaurants will be uh, take more attention to uh, 
exteriors to uh, surrounding places to open uh, places uh, but uh, the new normality comes to the huge formats for the shopping centers uh, which are still closing uh, for visiting uh, they start to um, think about how to change the formats, how to use open spaces around, how to uh, organize access to the sections from the street, not from the inside of shopping centers. And the uh, other point, 20% uh, uh, of office workers uh, will not return to their workers, uh, workplaces. Uh, and uh, owners of huge offices complexes start to um, to think about you know, how they bring the diversity of using their property uh, about how to introduce the mixed use in uh, their property and uh, so why that, those formats uh, uh, were not uh, feeling so well uh, in before but uh, the pandemic situation uh, just accelerated the death of a huge format in urban environment and this is something you which is coming now uh, here in St. Petersburg. Thank you, thank you very much Daniel. So new formality, uh, the new normality uh, is coming now from Karelia from small towns and from the countryside. We bring we have, the national to them. <laughs> yes. So we have three cities, um, three different sets of experiences. We have St. Petersburg, Barcelona, Amsterdam, and we not, with Nasty we have a little bit of Belarusia there, Grodno specifically. And it seems to me that uh, there are quite a number of uh, problematic points that uh, the pandemic revealed that need to be changing with the coming back to normality. One articulated so well by Enrique and Marguerite, there is something about the home that should not be taken for granted that the pandemic revealed and something about the home and its relationship to public space. So publicity or publicness and privacy um, need to be reorganized and need to be thought about very differently. Um, being outside, being outside was exposed in, in its problematic quality, in its problematic aspect. There needs to be a cause, there needs to be a reason. Being outside was thoroughly rationalized and the range of choices limited. So the outside is no longer what we thought of it before as just free move out of your apartment into the city. That's clearly changed with the pandemic. I returned to Nastya's point that feeling of normality is a privilege rather than something taken for granted. Um, I would like to go to return to the theme of elasticity of the system and specifically the city as a system. Perhaps when we discuss uh, our third question about the lessons learned and the changes that need to be brought to the city. But um, some of you brought up already question of government, the question of control. The question of the relationship between public authority and us private citizens. And I think it's fair to say that the pandemic problematized, politicized societies to the degree that was not seen before. Um, the Donald Trump or uh, Lukashenko's uh, dissident, self proclaimed dissidents on the corona issue activated certain tendencies. Um, I read about this as a civil society in case of Belarusia among citizens. But countries like Hungary, where the parliament dominated by Prime Minister Orban's Fidesz party um, approved a bill granting these government emergency powers without any deadline 
before those emergency powers being withdrawn or called back. So clearly, governments seize the opportunity, seize the moment to expand uh, their uh, purview over citizens' lives. And our sovereignty and our privacy has been compromised. Now, Hungary may be a very obvious example. But I would like to ask you to reflect on situations where similar contingencies were introduced and normalized in situations outside of pandemic, for example, before it, and the ways in which these governmental interventions control authoritative actions became part of our normal. So I would like to call Marguerite on this question. Thank you. Yeah. So um, besides disruption, which I think uh, Nastia pointed out so so very well, I think there's also a lot of consistency actually in the, in the responses to this uh, crisis, right? So I think a good uh, so a lot of the a lot of the measures that came in place now as part of this emergency package of uh, of measures were already to some extent in place or consistent with things that were, were uh, already happening, right? And so I think one of the things that, that, that are very concrete that we could think about in this, in this way is the, is the racialized policing that, uh, that happens across cities uh, in, in the world. And so, for example, under the COVID-19 measures in the Netherlands, you could, you could, be, you could not be together in, in public space with more than three people at a time, right? And so the police could ask people to disperse and to not be there or could even find people for being there uh, with larger groups. The thing is that this wasn't really so new uh, because the police in Rotterdam could already do this under the ban, a ban on uh, gathering that the city had instated in, 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 uh, in order to uh, solve all kinds of urban problems that were understood already to be an emergency situation, right? So this could happen already. The interesting thing, I think, is that at, you know when when we think about this particular topic, is that at the same time this this crisis offers an opening to not return to the normal, right? And I would like, just like Nastia, I would like to see it that way. I think that the you know the Black Lives Matter move, movements and protests that we've seen also across the Netherlands and really in in in, uh, in so much larger numbers than I I, I had foreseen are at the same time questioning these types of policing and, and use of authority in public space, right? So at the same time, when we see this use of authority there and, and power, we also see a, a very new and, and much intensified questioning of that. So I think there's also room there to, to, uh, to have an opening to not return to this, uh, to this normal and, and, to, and to do things differently. So racialized policing. That's yeah. Well, that's, it's just yeah. one example, right? I think one of the things that was really quite heavily disrupted, also in this crisis, was the was was the you know the 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 way in which reproductive labor happens, right? So, you know, the everyday labor of getting everybody to school and feeding everyone and washing clothes and all that stuff that usually takes place in the in the home for many people at least. And now all of a sudden, all of our work for our employers had to take place in this same space, right? And so this was heavily disrupted. I think this offers an opportunity, so this disruption offers an opportunity at the same time, right? Because it also brings into very sharp focus that we need better housing for our families and, and for everyone, right? Yeah. Thank you. We do. <laughs> Daniel, may I ask for your reflection? Yeah, um, I just uh, I just would like to um, to share you uh, a case in Moscow, uh, not here in Saint Petersburg. God, lucky us, uh, because uh, they uh, the administration of Moscow tried to test uh, the um, application, uh, so they they have restriction uh, uh, to. You know, don't move from your uh, house uh, from your house uh, more than 100 meters uh, and for uh, mass controlling this fact 
uh, if you'd like to uh, go out from your house, you have to download and install the app on your smartphone. Uh, <laughs> name it My City or uh, uh, Citizen. Uh, uh, something like this. And this app is controlling you uh, where you are going, uh, registering you uh, where you are, and uh, automatically uh, uh, get you the penalty if you are out uh, from restriction. You cannot uninstall this app after. They, they get uh, the, mm -hmm, I, I don't remember the, uh, one uh, digit, no, okay, they get a lot of uh, penalties in the first week of uh, testing this beautiful application. Uh, and uh, most of uh, Moscow, uh, Moscow citizens, uh, they, they are feeling that it's uh, some points of digital concent concentration camp uh, already came uh, to their Laugh and uh, not disappearing uh, uh, at all. Uh, some uh, some points of new normality already is here. So once once it sneaks into our phones, we cannot get rid of it, and the ominous uh, eye continues. Life you, you, you can you cannot neglecting this uh, this point of uh, this mode of control of your life of your everyday life. Right. Wow. This is a this is a yeah. disrupting point of new normality come to Moscow, like yours in Saint Petersburg. Okay. That's the new normality. Um, Margarita, I would like to go back uh, to you because I know that you've done work on uh, on the youth uh, in Rotterdam and the ban on gathering in public spaces. Could you say a bit more about that as it happened to become a law well before the pandemic? Yeah, so the, the so while uh, Rotterdam is a relatively affluent city, if you compare it uh, internationally in the Netherlands, it is very much understood as a, as a working class city with a very heavy industrial um, uh, history. And the idea is that, that in order to move past this industrial history, it needs to change quite dramatically and safety measures have come into play there. And so the, the story about Rotterdam is very much that the city needs to change very fundamentally if it is to become prosperous ever again. And one of the ways in which it needs to change, it needs to become much more uh, safe and whiter and more affluent uh, across the board. Um, and so this narrative has uh, created this state of emergency in a way, right? Where, where politicians and government for the longest time, really, we're talking 20 years or so, have been saying, well, well yes, but the situation in Rotterdam is so very serious. We, we, we are in a situation where it's actually legitimate uh, uh, to curtail uh, citizens' rights and so on. Um, this is very little debated, and everyone that does try and debate it gets sort of shut up <laughs> by, by by people that say, "Well, well, you know, if you if you if you're not for these quite extreme measures, you're just not taking our urban problems seriously enough, or you don't know the real problems, right?" So this was the situation before, and people like me that are, you know can be easily be read as white or middle class in the city don't encounter this ban on gathering. I can gather all I want in public space all the time, but it's very clear from research and also from you know, just experiences of especially young men of color in the city that this ban is very real for them and that they are asked to disperse all the time um, and, and, and not allowed just to be in public space with more than two people. Yeah. Okay. So this, the existence of the safety measures is actually not a new thing, but the pandemic built upon, uh, added, sedimented uh, what already was part of the governmentality and part of the public imagination about the safe urban space, right? So this actually brings us to our um, third question of, of discussion. 
Um, as the world continues to fight the rapid spread of coronavirus, confining many people to their homes and altering the ways in which we live in the city, think about our cities. Some people are wondering which of these adjustments will endure or should endure beyond the end of the pandemic and what life might life uh, might look like on the other side and i believe that one of the most pressing questions that urban planners will face in their parent tension uh, between safety and urban life is the question of densification and use of urban space so the push towards cities becoming more concentrated as a way to promote and improve environmental sustainability and at the same time disaggregation the separating out of populations which has been one of the key tools uh, used to hold back the infection transmission right so densification and disaggregation and control at least this is what richard Sennett recently voiced in his, uh, uh, in his interview to The Guardian. So I would like to invite you to reflect using your professional positions, not only your personal knowledge, on what lessons should we take from um, the pandemic what challenge uh, how how can we learn from the challenges posed by the pandemic and is there a need to design for the future pandemic and if so how or maybe you think that these are not the questions to pose um in Ines, in Ines, okay, I am going to be quick. Uh, well, uh, here in Barcelona, maybe Enrique will talk about that later on. Uh, there are um, there have been many articles on papers talking about the fact of um, having more space for 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 citizens or for people to that walk and so on. For pedestrians, indeed, um, and this 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 was a kind of uh, a kind of a measure that was taken in order to have this distancing policy that uh, it's what they call the new normality. Um, there have been loads of uh, of uh, of uh, agreements about that, but I think that uh, the main opportunity that the, the this pandemic but in terms of planning, it's not the fact that we uh, that we can find a good uh, answer to this specific situation. Because this specific situation today is like it is, and tomorrow will be another. And if other pandemics or other uncertainties that are not a pandemic, but maybe maybe other ones, um, he, uh, come, we, we have to be well, not maybe prepared. We we maybe have be aware that we cannot plan everything, and, you know? and, and I think that new, pl uh, new planning or new urban planning needs to accept this uncertainty that the pandemic is show to us. And, uh, and this is a question that it has not been um, posed or pointed out so much as other questions uh, about density or segregation that we were talking about before. Have, uh, have been pointed out. And this is the one that I wanted to, to point out, the, 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 the importance of, ha of having into account that we have to be prepared for planning uh, inside the uncertainty, having into account that we cannot know everything and maybe this pandemic will finish and another one will come and we, we won't need uh, two meters of distance, but we need something else. And we we are not prepared for everything, and in this, in this this could be positive because it makes more complex our our daily life and our space in which we have our gatherings and our relations. 
So, Ines, do I hear you right saying that not only we cannot plan for everything, we might not want to plan for everything. And there is a positivity in the attitude that anything might happen. Yeah, I think that this is positive in you. Yeah. Okay. I totally Thank you. agree. And I totally agree, actually. I think that we should plan our cities, our homes, our careers, our lives, um, regardless of the difficulties that they have to face. Um, we have to have a higher goal. Uh, that's absolutely necessary. We cannot limit, and this is what the powers actually want us to do. Uh, we cannot limit our uh, actions to reactions. Uh, we have to have something uh, on purpose, pur 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 purpose purposefully uh, addressing whatever it is that we feel like addressing. Um, in this sense, <clears throat> this idea of this false debate between densification and degradation, etc., I think it's a false debate. Densification is here to stay. We cannot do without densification. It's the only way we can inhabit this planet, we humans. Uh, and if the difference is between one, uh, one uh, half meter or two meter or 50 centimeters distance between people, you know, that's a very uh, banal debate, actually. The debate is another thing. With the, I wanted to stress the fact that in the last two decades, all over the world, there has been a regaining of public space as socializing space all over the world. Uh, this is the so-called Mediterranean lifestyle, you know, living in the streets, living in the bars, etc. But you can see it in Copenhagen, you can see it in um, Stockholm, you can see it in Oslo, you can see it in Amsterdam, of all places, etc. Uh, this regaining of the public space as a socializing space is something that it has taken uh, a couple of decades and an effort. Even in St. Petersburg, we were able a few years back to use public space as a socializing space, to use the city as a socializing space. And this is something we cannot uh, neither give for granted nor give away. And I would fight for keeping up the uh, use of public space as a socializing area of a, a sort of enlargement of our uh, lives, uh, a sort of larger domain of our experiences. Thank you, Enrique. Nastya. Yeah, um, I'm not a practitioner, but I'm the person who likes to poke uh, sticks in practitioners, ask questions, problematize things, sometimes agree, disagree with them. And um, in a way I would agree with an as an Eric in a way, regarding the necessity to resist this temptation to design for pandemic or to plan for pandemic. I also don't think that it, it should be the vision. But on the other hand, it also should be a space, as far as I see it and imagine, to change things, uh, to change manifesto of things in a way, especially in regards to housing and the domestic space. We've already mentioned a lot of things about domestic space, the need for better housing, the unsafety, the very strict separation between public and private. With pandemic, it's very clear that home is now one of the most kind of politicized spaces. It is important. People talk about it. We have research done on how people adapt their home spaces. People say it's not enough flexible, we have lack of privacy, we have lack of tranquility, sounds, everything bothers. 
children need to be monitored and so on and so on. But I think that such a lack of privacy and tranquility as um, in different cities people keep saying and uh, reporting on, it's not a result of pandemic lockdown. It's kind of a logical outcome of how we understand the design of domestic space. It's a space of containment, a space where things need to be hidden, the bodies need to be separated, but it's never done perfectly and maybe it shouldn't be done perfectly. So my invitation then to practitioners, architects, designers, planners would be like, let's imagine a new model of domestic space where it's not designed for a monogamous family composed of three family members, and where private and public needs to be separated so strictly, where rhythms and lifestyles needs to be arranged in a perfect machine, but rather that actually architecture of domesticity can allow things to be a little bit, yeah, porous, but not isolating, not containing, circulating sometimes, but not only for families that are normative models of families, but for student dormitories, for refugee camps, for polyamorous families, for extended families. That would be my invitation for the design. Hargarit, would you like to add to that? Oh, I'm I'm in full agreement. Yeah, <laughs> I think no, so. I yeah, I would definitely think that this crisis is an invitation to to, to rethink this architecture of the whole, right? Which is a horribly isolating architecture and and uh, and all women that have been isolated in these homes know this right so this is the and i think also in terms of the environmental crisis or the or the climate crisis that we're in it's just it, we we need to think about our forms of architecture that that will allow for ways of living together that that in which we do not all need our individual kitchens and bathrooms and so on because you know one of the one of the things that made everything so very busy and hectic for everyone uh, that in this crisis that that had to take care of others, whether they children or, or elderly people or so on, uh, was the fact that we were all you know cooking our own food in our own house in this isolation, right? Wouldn't it be just uh, in, um, amazing if there would indeed be some circulation, as uh, Nastia calls it? Uh, there and some possibility to share some of these tasks beyond this household. I, I think that 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 would be a, a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to take here. And you know, there's a there's an archive in feminist design that we could use for this, right? So we we, we don't have to think of all of this just from scratch. Yeah. We'll ask for um, for a reference, more details um, on that. Um, Dani Yar, so what are the challenges and lessons of the pandemic that you think we should learn, we, you as architectural professionals? Yep, mm, I have two points, uh, sorry. Uh, that uh, It's obviously that uh, we have to <clears throat> radically reorganize our public transportation system because uh, inform that we have uh, at the day, uh, we cannot uh, exclude the uh, uh, suddenly gathering and concentration. So uh, the technical solutions uh, there are a lot, uh, but we have we don't have still a legislative uh, legislative uh, solution for them for, to introduce that kind of. Uh, uh, personal public transportation system, I will call it. Uh, it, it's a one point and uh, other point that um, uh, pa pandemic situations is, is not uh, something new uh, for uh, urban planners for cities uh, in Euro in Europe and the world uh, that uh, we have a lot of uh, instruments how to uh, what to do how to do, how to act uh, in uh, in urban planning, in architectural solutions, and uh, in uh, even into design, uh, those chrome co covered uh, uh, handles uh, in the public transport, for example. There, uh, um, but the the new, which is coming uh, uh, now, uh, which this pandemic wave is an infodemic, which uh, which were much more effective than. Uh, uh, epidemic itself. The infodemic, wider, uh, forcer than, uh, than epidemic. 
and uh, how to how to keep uh, your clear imagination how to keep uh, the goal of your activity and uh, your life uh, there is a <clears throat> Uh, point for no, not for not only for designers for architects for urban planners as well uh, no, because uh, with this infodemic effect we have uh, outbreak of domestic violence uh, we have uh, violence on the street on USA you know uh, what they are, have now um, uh, how to um, how to design architecture and urban plan uh, can keep, can uh, allow you to uh, uh, to follow your narrow GDN, uh, narrow wealth, uh, narrow, to keep your narrow system in form and uh, a good reaction and understanding what is going on. Uh, there is a new frontier for a design of a uh, new century, as for me. I would like to think that our conversation tonight is a way to keeping our imagination, our mind in good shape, right? And create better imaginary of the post pandemic life. Um, I, we have quite a number of very interesting comments, questions and interventions, and I'm going to go uh, through them and I will invite you to pick up questions as you feel, as they speak to you or not. Um, there is a very interesting comment and correction uh, about the Moscow application that you, Daniel, brought up, that it can actually be deleted as bad as the application is. So people are allowed to delete it right after the quarantine. The date is st stated in the documents uh, that uh, users sign. But we also know that often deleting the application does not delete trace. Yep. Yeah, that's oh, a, some part of codes uh, are still keeping in your smartphone and still uh, and they uh, and they still are working and uh, some and they are guessing so your da data they are uh, launching those data I don't know where nobody know uh, nowhere it is a, it is not a bad design it's a <laughs> it yeah. was a good, it's good design. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's 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 a very smart design, right? Um, so here is a here is a question uh, from Oleg uh, Oleg Pachinkov, uh, the organizer of the series, who reminded us that in the previous in the first lecture a few days ago, Michel Le Charlou, architect and urbanist from Bordeaux, um, mentioned that it was a mistake that no pol not politicians but medical experts dictated the decision of political nature and the question to all of us is what do you think uh, is the role of architects in this situation shall architects and planners advise politicians on what issues and are you ready to advise politicians the way medical experts did in this pandemic. No one ever asks when sociologists are going to rule the society. Why it's on never a question. <laughs> Maybe we, we just should move in and seize the opportunity. So medical experts advised politicians on the measures taken in the pandemic, but neither sociologists no architects and planners were asked to do so. Let's imagine a utopian situation when we are actually asked, would you want to do that? On what issues? And what would you propose? It's an interesting question, I think, but um, it's a tricky one in the sense that it's I believe it's not a matter of expertise, it's a matter of political and 
political gathering of expertise. Uh, I mean, for instance, here in Spain, and talking especially in our situation, there was a collapse uh, of different levels of governance uh, towards the recentralization of powers. Uh, you know that Spain is somehow um, a federal uh, government. Um, but in the case of pandemics, the president, the Spanish president, literally said, there are some times where Spain must be one, and there are some times where Spain can be many. Uh, that was the literal sentence he said. Uh, and with that, he collapsed absolutely all the knowledge and all the budgets uh, in the health uh, organizations that were not centralized. Uh, and he made things worse by two or three weeks. Instead of relying on the knowledge of every place where all the data was gathered, all the knowledge was um, uh, gathered, all the resources were uh, uh, placed. Instead of that, he took the opportunity to centralize the government. What I'm saying is that it doesn't matter if you ask for an expert for his or her opinion. It depends on what you want to do with that opinion. And if, if he had asked for, I don't know, for um, urban design uh, standards, for instance, which are also decentralized, they belong to every um, province of Spain, um, he, would have done, he would have done the same. And he still wouldn't have had the knowledge what to do with the cities. He wouldn't have had the budget to do anything at all in the cities. But he would have had the willingness to centralize the power in Madrid. So uh, is it important what they ask for the experts? I don't think so. What is important is what they want to do with the information they have. I don't know if I made myself clear enough, uh, but this is a, a new vector I wanted to bring in into the discussion. Anyone else would like? Daniela? Yeah. Yes. Uh, for uh, centuries, European and uh, American people were fighting for freedom. And it uh, seems that in the middle of last century, they finally come to the personal freedom. And the new century starts uh, uh, with losing that freedom step by step. Uh, first, we lose uh, some part of our freedom uh, in exchange of public security, uh, fighting against the terrorism, and, and, and etc. Now we have a step uh, to lose uh, another step uh, in exchange of uh, public health. Uh, the next one, I don't know uh, where we, uh, we can expect from uh, financial security or uh, something, uh, something like that. How we architects and urban planners and designers can act in this situation, I don't know. Uh, the, the fight for the freedom, uh, not for the, for the design. Okay, thank you, Dania. Ines? I like to, yeah, I would like to say say something. I I, I think that I agree with both of, of, of the other speakers, but I want to also point out that maybe um the the, the decisions that have been have been taken have have been too focused maybe in in, in public health issues, although not sure if they were also public health issues as Enric told us before, but uh, there were there was this sense that uh, uh, we have this uh, need of knowing um, what we need to do in terms of public health or epidemic or whatever, but we were not taking into account another things that were also important as we were talking before uh, in terms of of social behavior, in terms of um, the psychic needs or whatever, no. And then uh, we were too focused in one thing 
and maybe we were not taking into account many others what that we should and maybe space was one of those things but there were many others that we were like forgetting only for one purpose and i think that this is always a bit dangerous in terms of politics and also in terms of planning thank you i think speaking of purposes uh, there is a really excellent question uh, here i'll have to make it shorter but bear with me um, so many people mentioned that the lockdown however hard it was it was still bearable because it had some logic but what was more difficult was the transitional period getting out of the lockdown because there it was less clear what was the um, what was the purpose what was the essence of uh, of the action of the norm so also looking at the action of lukashenko or orban or trump and their more populistic decisions it can be argued that they wanted by not introducing lockdowns to avoid the breakdown of routine in the way they were protecting the normal. And so the question follows, is it possible that by protecting broader societal values and norm, we appeal to something superhuman, something that matters more than the individual human life. Shall we say that the approach, I think the approach of populist leaders is challenging humanism as such. Do you, did I make question understandable? So in the way, if we, kind of interpret the action of uh, corona dissident leaders as an attempt to protect the social normal and willing to sacrifice individual lives in the course of this protection. Shall we say that there, this approach is challenging humanism as an ideology, humanism as a paradigm, as such. I hope I'm rendering this question correctly. I, 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 just, I just have this response. I would be more interested in a challenge that did not involve quite so many deaths. That's a very sharp answer. Um, I would also try to think about it because I feel the question contains few questions inside. That's why I'm thinking, what shall I focus on? The, the intention of Lukashenko, Trump, to protect the normal in order to protect people from the crisis of getting out of the lockdown. I'm not sure that's how we should ask the question of this personalized intentions. And I cannot imagine that that was the one. I do agree that indeed decision making during this process involves a lot of discussions on what is a common good. And that's basically maybe what is meant by humanist he humanism here, the value. Um, there are many different normals that, that are at stake and called one name, uh, normal of the things that they wear, or normal as the things of, of we want them to be, normal as the things that value personal life and personal freedom, or normal as the things that value the uh, life of the population. In that sense, not taking any lockdown measures protects economy as the common good. And for me, from my ethical and political stance, capitalist economy is not the common good I'm voting for. So I don't see it as, as kind of a um, protective mode, yeah. Then yeah. Um, and many, many cultural aspects, we see that uh, now we're <clears throat> we're in the age of end of 
uh, illumination as a concept. Uh, not on the end, uh, but on the, uh, on the death point. So it's a normal that we have uh, new normals. We, we are shifting to new normals. Uh, it's a new norm, normal uh, at this point. So uh, because of the end of illumination, we will see some flashing person and fighters, uh, which are... Um, <clears throat> uh intended to bring uh, back the the values of uh this era uh but we see because of that point uh they will disappear in the near future i have a question for all of you since there is a new normal and we cannot deny it what are the two things that you would bring back to the core of urban normality of this new urban normality um, i'm not sure there is a new normal but if you say so you're the sociologist so um, I believe you. Uh, I would bring back the dissolution between interior and exterior spaces, the dissolution between public and private spaces. That was the normal that we were working for very hardly in our school, also in our uh, master program in St. Petersburg, to normalize life uh, outside the house. Ines, next year. Um, uh, well, I, I'm not also sure if there's a new normality now, but I would say that uh, I would like to well, yeah, maybe to have a, a kind, a kind of um, empowerment in relation with space that we were fighting for, and we have loosened dur during the lockdown. It, it looks like our the place was not, uh, the, the, well, I mean, or at least the public space and open space were not the. The space for gathering or for having like um, um, spontaneous relations. I would like to, to to gain that again. Thank you. Um, next year. Um, I would definitely bring back the collective public gatherings, and in some places, it would mean bringing back something that was already prohibited for quite some time, uh, especially following up on news in Russia and pro feminist protests, um, in which um, a lot of protesters were arrested for even individual piquets, like the queuing that people do now because they are prohibited of gathering together. Um, this thing is, a, is the basic necessity for urban life for me in the authoritarian regimes in particular. So that would be my dream. Okay. The gathering, the crowdness, the collectivism mm -hmm. of the city. Thank you. Marguerite. Yeah, for, for me, I, I'd like to bring back life, right? So urban life in the sense of, of, uh, of meeting others and not just the people that are, are, are that with which you have some sameness, right? So for people that are from very different walks of life, I'd like to meet them and come closer to them than we've been able to in, the, in these past few weeks, yeah. The value of difference, the encounter with the different. Thank you. And then you are. Mm, uh, I would like to bring back uh, cheap and fast uh, uh, trans-regional travels and allowing to gather with my students and small groups and uh, whenever we want. That would be good. I would like to bring back us 
sitting around the table, talking face to face, seeing our audience, Luba, Vadim, Yulia, Oleg, Lilia, all the friends who are there and not friends, but who still are there, it would be a really now wonderful luxury to be together and to be in one space. Mm -hmm. I think it is clear that cities once again are being thrust into public attention, into new political imaginary and the new everyday imaginary as they always been throughout the 20th century. In that regard, the 20th century is no different. And I hope that the conversation this evening helps us together as an urban collective to sharpen some of the ideas and the tools for realizing them for a better urban normality. How to do it practically, but also how to imagine it in the first place, even if it might be not always practical. For practicalities, imagination, learning, please come to the European University in St. Petersburg Urbanism and Participation Lab to building the city now, postgraduate transdisciplinary program in urban design and architecture. And to Institute Frances, which supports this series of lectures and discussions. I would like to thank again Oleg Pachinkov for mobilizing us and inspiring us and providing the space for a conversation. I would like very much to thank Anna Krasnova, the invisible hand of this discussion. I would very much like to thank my speakers, Enrique Messibosch, Anastasia Galavnova, Marguerite Vandenberg, Daniyar Yusupov and Ines, and I would like to thank everybody who joined us in this chat for a conversation and post questions and provoked our thinking and conversation. Thank you all. Please stay tuned. There is one more uh, table discussion within the framework of this series taking place on the 6th of May. It will be moderated by Oleg Pachinkov. Меня зовут Ольга Сезнева. Я была очень рада встретиться с вами, быть с вами и вести эту дискуссию. Спасибо большое всем. Я закрываю сессию. Всего доброго. Thank you, Olga. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye. Bye.